There are a lot of ways to raise animals for consumption. And while some would argue we shouldn't be eating animals at all, others advocate rooting out the cruelest of those practices, the ones that cause the most suffering for animals. But how do you measure cruelty? And do some animals deserve to suffer less than others because they're especially cute or smart? And does your right to enjoy a fancy or delicious meal trump the right of an animal to not experience extreme cruelty? In this episode, we look at three controversial foods, veal, foie gras, and octopus, and the campaigns launched by animal rights activists to stop their production and consumption. These foods and the animals they come from have a lot to teach us about the ethics of animal agriculture, and possibly about ourselves. I'm Jerusha Klemperer, and this is What You're Eating, a project of foodprint.org. We aim to help you understand how your food gets to your plate and to see the full impact of the food system on animals, planet, and people. We uncover the problems with the industrial food system and offer examples of more sustainable practices, as well as practical advice for how you can help support a better system through the food that you buy and the system changes you push for. 30 to 50 years ago, people were eating a lot of veal. It was an extremely popular product, both at home and on restaurant menus. And it wasn't just fancy white tablecloth restaurants. It was even on the Burger King menu where they briefly sold a veal parmesan sandwich. The new veal parmesan specialty sandwich at Burger King is delicioso. But now you don't see it on many menus, and most of us never eat it at all. And a lot of people think of it as a particularly cruel product. The veal parmesans and veal marsalas of old fancy restaurant menus have largely been replaced with chicken counterparts. That disappearance and fall from favor wasn't an accident. So what happened? My name is Daisy Freund. I'm the vice president of farm animal welfare for the ASPCA. That's the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And in that role, I get to lead an amazing team of people who are trying to improve the lives of the more than 10 billion animals raised in the food system each year. We work through corporate engagement, consumer education, and policy reform to achieve that improvement in their lives and build a better food system. Most people know that veal is a baby cow whose meat is prized for its pale color and tender mouthfeel. But what you might not know is that veal was created as a product to make use of the male dairy calves who have no place in dairy production. So very simply put, veal is the meat of calves versus beef, which comes from an older animal. Veal calves come from the dairy industry, which functions by impregnating dairy cows so that they induce lactation. Nine million calves are born as a result of mother cows being impregnated to create milk and other dairy products for human consumption. Dairy calves are almost uniformly taken away from their mothers within hours or a couple days after birth. Obviously, 50% of the calves born in dairy are female, and some of them become what are known as replacement dairy cows. Not all of them. The replacement rate in mainstream dairy is about 32%. So 32% of the 9 million calves born will remain on the farm, and they're all female, and they will end up being the future uh, mother cows and, and milkers. Until about 20 years ago, many, most of the remaining millions of calves went into the veal industry. And so until about 20 years ago, after separation from mothers, veal production largely involved confining these newborn animals in crates that were barely bigger than an animal's body. So about two feet by four and a half feet wide. And the calves were housed individually and the crates prevented any physical contact between calves and sometimes even visual contact with other calves. So total social isolation. Calves were, were often tied in the front of the crate by a tether, a very short tether, which restricted their movement. In some uh, veal crate systems, the calves were also kept in the dark, usually without bedding, and fed nothing but milk. And all of these practices were designed to limit the movement of the animal and to keep the meat white and soft, which was what consumers preferred or what had been really marketed about veal. So these are baby animals. You know, when you see a, a calf out in the field with its mother, it is jumping and running and playing. 
if given the opportunity, these are really frisky animals and those are all natural behaviors that support their well-being. And so without any exercise or any sensory or social or nutritional health, all of that deprivation, the calves would become very weak. Their muscles would atrophy, develop ulcers um, and all these stereotypical behaviors because they were denied the ability to nurse or socialize at all. And those are all indicative of stress. Uh, and then, of course, naturally, they were more susceptible to diseases, pneumonia, diarrhea, super common in, in veal calves. Today, veal production does look different in terms of both its scale and the practices that are used. So just about 400,000 calves are moved into the veal industry each year. That's down from a peak of 3.4 million calves around 20 years ago or so. It's a huge reduction, um, and industry groups now claim that all milk-fed veal calves in the U.S. are untethered. They're raised in groups by at least 10 weeks of age, if not earlier, and until that time, they're raised in individual hutches. There is space to move and turn and bedding in those hutches, so they may be isolated during those first 10 weeks or so, but they have sight lines to other animals, contact with other calves, space to move. And there's a lot of reasons for that change, namely a huge public sentiment shift around the product. And that led to, to industry and policy changes. In 2007, the American Veal Association's board of directors approved a policy that fully transitioned to group housing by the end of 2017, and they did meet that goal. And then in recent years, some states have taken steps to protect farm animal welfare and ban extreme confinement, the use of battery cages for laying hens, gestation crates for mother pigs, and veal crates for calves. So there's 15 states that ban some form of confinement, and 10 of them specifically have a veal crate ban. But industry doesn't change on its own, nor does public sentiment. So I asked Daisy, what happened to initiate those shifts? It was really a remarkable moment in animal rights and welfare when sentiment shifted around veal. It did not happen by accident. It was a coordinated effort, and it involved incredible work by a lot of animal groups. Undercover investigations were at, really at the heart of the change. They revealed that painful separation of mothers and calves and particularly the use of tethers and crates to prevent calves from moving and the extremely unnatural conditions that these animals were living in, just the utter deprivation that they were enduring. And that led to, as these undercover investigations tend to, a swell of negative coverage for the industry, and then a rise of a coordinated national veal boycott led by some animal groups and that ultimately caused this steep decline in the market for the product. In the 50s and 60s, Americans ate four pounds of veal a year on average. And today, per capita consumption is less than half a pound a year. I think most people consider veal not even something they'd touch and not a part of their diet at all, no matter what else they eat. This shift in public opinion and the consequential decline in consumption of veal is a big deal. This was definitely the most successful animal welfare campaign ever. And even as the industry has responded by shifting its practices and making things more humane, consumers still are really not eating veal. The bad impression stuck. The change affected by the veal boycott, by these undercover investigations, it really speaks to the power of consumers. The fact that when consumers say, absolutely not, this is unacceptably abusive, it can lead to tidal waves of change in the food industry. And that's encouraging to me personally. It's really what's driven the ASPCA to focus so much of its time on consumer change as a tool, regardless of what people eat, to really drive market change and then drive industry change. But it is interesting that even with improvements, this product did not rebound. But just because conditions for calves have improved and consumption has gone way down, it doesn't mean this is a clean victory because there are still baby males from the dairy industry and we still don't have a place for them to go since they have no use in dairy production. Some of those animals go into the beef industry, some of them are exported, and some of them are killed right away. And that, I think, is the dirty secret here. To back up and explain that, the dairy calves produced today 
do not gain weight easily or produce high quality beef because their genetics are so focused on, on dairy rather than meat production. They're almost two different animals, similar to how there's a type of chicken that is producing chicken meat and a type of chicken that's laying eggs. They really look different. They act different. Their genetics are enormously different. So I think a lot of people assume that, well, there's not veal demand anymore, but those animals are probably going into beef. To some degree, that's true. There is a joint uh, beef and dairy industry program called Beef on Dairy. And that sends from our research about three, three and a half million calves, mostly steers, and then some heifer calves to feedlots from dairy farms. It's a pretty remarkable amount of our beef supply now that's coming from the dairy industry. They are really going into the sort of low end beef supply, usually ground beef, because as I said, they're not designed to produce high quality beef and, you know, some of the cuts that people would be looking for. There's another 2 million calves left though. So what's happening to them? They're either live exported uh, and that's a very low number. From what we can tell, the USDA doesn't separate out cattle and calf numbers. So it's hard to get a, a really clear number, but it's under half a million. Sadly, that's that's a very stressful experience for those animals. But the vast majority of those calves, and this checks out with the USDA's numbers on disposition of animals, roughly 21% or about 2 million calves, one in five calves, are called on farm. They're killed on farm within hours or days of being born, often by blunt force trauma. That practice is, is widely acknowledged. It's not really a secret when you look closely at the industry. They talk about it. It's in the scientific literature. And it's said over and over that that is happening because it's the only economically viable choice for those farmers. There's no need for the animals in the dairy sector. Most of them are males, but even some of them are females, and they just don't need to replace the herd that fast. There's very limited returns or demand for them in the beef sector, and there's no market for veal. And so any care or feed or labor or space that's devoted to the animals by the farmer is lost revenue for the farmer because they just have so little value in the current system and the margins are so low in the dairy industry. So we just have to ask ourselves, why? You know, why would animals be killed and discarded right after they're born in an industry that's meant to feed people, that's meant to raise animals to feed people? It's also enormously wasteful, and it's pointing to a system that's just out of whack, that's broken. And that is really by design. And so there is someone who might hear that and think, wait, so are you saying it was better for them to be funneled into a product that could be eaten? Like, do you wish that then these cows were all going to become some more humanely produced veal? It's very positive that veal production as it was in the 80s and before that ended, that animals are not housed in cruel deprivation. That needed to end. The problem that exists now is that we didn't address the system that they were coming from. One of the most common forms of cruelty that's documented right now on, on dairy farms is the mistreatment of newborn calves and these botched, inhumane on-farm killings. Right now, there's no incentive to treat these animals decently at all. Before the 1970s, farmers never euthanized animals, not just because there was a market for veal, but because the farms just looked different. They were raising hundreds, not tens of thousands of cows. And the farms were more diversified. There were different types of animals, different types of markets, and the markets were much closer to the farm. So they were serving a more local population. And the animals were largely eating grass, which actually was much less expensive than relying on the feed market as farmers do now. So their margins were not so tight. And over time, farms have become highly specialized, concentrated, enormous mega dairies that are reliant on all these external factors and really driven by agribusiness and by federal policies that are broken. The policies that have been implemented over the last 30 to 40 years have been protecting milk as a commodity. They've been incentivizing farmers to get big, to make up for low prices with big volume or to get out. And that set up this vicious cycle where production has increased, it floods the market, the prices go down. And obviously that's resulted in Tons of small farms closing. It's resulted in dairy farmers uh, having an enormously high rate of suicide. And when you have 
farms that are as unstable and economically unviable as this, where the cost of milk production is below what a farmer is taking home, it's, it's almost impossible to expect them to make costly improvements to how animals are treated. And what's really needed is, is a, a complicated set of solutions on the federal level that we're calling for through this farm bill. But it will take a coalition effort and very deep reform to get animals to a place where they are not considered discardable. Veal might have fallen out of favor, but other excessively cruel products haven't. In New York City, where foie gras is on the trendiest and fanciest menus, the sale of foie gras was actually banned in 2019, and it was supposed to go into effect in 2022. But the ban was contested by the state, and it's currently tied up in the legal system. But New York City's ban isn't the first, and it might not be the last. And it touches on some of the most crucial animal welfare questions at the heart of our food system. So foie gras is actually a French term that translates to fatty liver. And that is what they're going for. The foie gras industry is going for a very specific type of change in the liver of a duck. My name is Cheryl Leahy. I'm executive director of Animal Outlook, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that focuses on farmed animal issues. We do undercover investigations, legal advocacy, vegan outreach and sort of cultural mainstreaming and farm transitions work. In this country, they use specially bred ducks. In other countries, they also use geese to create this ultimately, you know, the so-called delicacy or, you know, this product called foie gras. So what's actually happening is they're force feeding the animal with a metal pipe multiple times a day over the course of several weeks. And that whole process is really sort of engineered down to the wire because it's so bad for the animals. If they kept going even for a couple of extra days, the mortality rate would just spike so high that it wouldn't make sense for them to you know, continue to do it because they'd have so many dead animals on their hands. So they're walking them right up to the brink of death by this process. And what they're doing is essentially like a corn mash is being force fed and it's the equivalent of a human eating like 30 pounds of pasta a day. By that, I mean not just the quantity, but also it's not really nutritionally what the animals need. So if you look at a photo of a healthy liver of a duck and compare that side by side with a foie gras liver, the difference is striking because the texture and the color, it's like the healthy liver is sort of a smooth brown liver and it's small. And the foie gras liver is, it can be eight to 12 times the size. It's a completely different color. It's like sort of a waxy, yellowish, fatty color. And obviously the texture is completely different. So that's what they're going for. That is a diseased state of the liver. There's a term for it called hepatic lipidosis, which means fatty liver disease. Ducks and geese are not the only ones who get fatty liver disease. It's actually like a known thing that other species can get. The job of the liver is to process toxins in the body. So if you're impairing the liver function to such a huge degree, you're also going to see other problems that have something called hepatic encephalopathy, which is like brain swelling. You see investigations footage of these animals panting. There is some investigations footage where the animals are being eaten alive, like their rear ends are being eaten by rats because they can't get moving. There's necropsy showing that the birds are, you know, throwing up the feed. There's perforations like holes in the esophagus from the actual force feeding process. So the whole thing is extremely cruel. There's actually only two companies that are producing foie gras. Almost all of the foie gras in the United States only comes from two companies. So you can do your own little investigation online and see, you know, what they have and kind of how they market everything. And, you know, I'd encourage people also just to Google an image of a healthy liver and you can compare that even to the very shiny and carefully curated marketing that the foie gras companies are doing. And you can just see the dramatic difference. The extreme nature of this particular product and its peripheral place in our diets makes it a good target for a ban. And there have been attempts to get production or sales of foie gras banned in varying cities and states around the country to varying degrees of success. In 2006, there was an unsuccessful proposed ban in Chicago. Yeah, there was an alderman that introduced the ban, and 
I think there was pretty savvy PR on the part of the foie gras industry at that time to build this whole narrative around how, you know, this is tradition and this is important. And, you know, any ban is just sort of a nanny state. And, you know, Chicago politics is an interesting whole topic that, you know, we definitely do not have time to get into, but the mayor's office is really powerful. And ultimately, uh, Mayor Daly at the time called the, the law the silliest law. They overturned it and they called the law the silliest law that he'd ever heard or something like that. During that time, I think it was 2006, they still sold tons of foie gras. And then there, you know, there were like radio DJs being like, we don't want to go into Chicago, send people out into the suburbs. Like it, it made, they made it a big culture war. And I think the problem when you have something entrenched where the job of the cruel industry is just to perpetuate the status quo, all they have to do is create controversy because then it just helps them. You know, I think it was encouraging to see the ban happen in the first place, but obviously it was not a match for some of these more nefarious tactics by the industry. You know, fortunately, we have California, you know, California ban is is back in place. And there are a number of countries all across the world that ban the product. It's not as though this is a fringe issue, right? This is something that if you ask any person walking down the street, is this okay with you? You're going to get overwhelming opposition to foie gras. The California ban was passed in 2004 and went into effect in 2012. It was both a sales ban and a production ban, which means it may have nudged the one California foie gras producer to phase out the product. But California restaurants found ways to ignore it or work around it. And almost immediately, the ban was challenged and sent into a series of legal maneuverings, including a lower court case that found that the state foie gras law was preempted by federal law. That was eventually reversed. And currently, the ban still exists. And, you know, I I would say a lot of the publicity around it was really successful. But, I mean, I think it's still a major question mark whether there's any enforcement or if there is, whether it's meaningful enforcement. So that's something that's, you know, a major issue. And then we still have the fact that we've got those two farms in New York. They're still doing their thing. It's over a dozen countries. You know, it's California. And then you've got this New York City situation, which is running into troubles, legal troubles and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's like everybody knows this product is cruel. It's clearly violating the state animal cruelty law. There's a huge, huge majority of the population that opposes it. And there they go still, you know, making millions of dollars on it every year. Can you talk about the state animal cruelty law? I'm I'm interested in getting into a little how the law protects animals on state level or federal level? Yeah, so I'll give you a little tutorial of the legal landscape as it applies to farmed animals in the United States. It's a short tutorial (laughs) because there's not that much. So at the federal level, from a time an animal is born or hatched until the time that they are sent off to be slaughtered, there is nothing or historically has been nothing that applies to those animals at all. What that really leaves us with at the what we call the on-farm level, so born or hatched until sent off to slaughter, is state animal cruelty laws. Most states, about 37 states, have exemptions for things like common or standard or normal agricultural practices. I would argue and strongly feel, if you look at the language of the statute and the legislative history and the whatever case laws out there, which admittedly is not a lot of case law in most states, that those exemptions are not categorical. And by that, I mean, just because something is done on a dairy or a foie gras facility or, you know, a chicken farm, it doesn't mean that it cannot be touched by the cruelty law. And we have had a lot of success taking our investigations footage and doing what we can to get enforcement, either through the enforcement agencies that are tasked with that kind of enforcement or finding ways around it through either like a private prosecution avenue or a civil avenue or finding ways to sue using causes of action and lawsuits that have nothing to do with animals, but where the cruelty is an underlying issue. So there's actually quite a bit of creative and interesting lawyering that can be done and that I think is very much worth the effort to do. But at the end of the day, you have a a landscape where in most cases, in almost all states, The cruelty law is exclusively criminal, 
And in most cases, that can only be enforced by like the sheriff's department, the district attorney's office, right? Like the people who are, you know, government agencies that are charged with these sorts of things. And in most states, you have exemptions. So even though they're not categorically broad exemptions, they have this effect of making these prosecutor's offices or the animal control or whoever's doing the initial investigation very nervous about using their own judgment on these things and very willing to defer to what the industry is doing or is saying. So what's cool about New York and what's sort of maddening about the whole situation in New York is that it does not have one of these exemptions. So there's no reason why the cruelty code could not and should not be used to go after foie gras. It's so clearly cruel. It's not sort of mixed up in some of the other cultural trappings of other animal products. And it's in a state where there is no exemption. The cruelty exists at corporate or institutional levels almost exclusively, right? If you're looking at how cruelty laws are enforced, you know, here and there, neglect on a dog and cat, right? That's very different from billions of animals. So we have to do our job as animal advocates and animal lawyers to make the law work for these animals. But just as importantly, I think, is just using this example as a mirror to society to say, do you care about animal cruelty? Are you willing to let this system fail these animals, right? In numbers that we can't even wrap our minds around. It was interesting to read some of the media coverage around the New York ban and the California ban and chefs sort of passionately describing rich people's right to eat something delicious and fancy and then categorizing it as a culturally significant food as like having this French heritage that was super important. And obviously at issue there, this thing of like the human right to eat something delicious really showcases that hierarchy, of course, of human rights as being more important and human rights meaning like the human right to eat something yummy, human rights as being above animal rights. And at issue here with foie gras is this idea of extreme suffering, right? The idea of cruelty um, and kind of all of these gradations of like, what is extreme suffering? Is it okay if they only kind of sort of suffer? I would love to respond to your point about the media and the chefs real quick, because I think what you just described is such an interesting example of how media can be manipulated. The media loves stories where there's a conflict and where you can have one side battle with the other side. So that's going to look like a debate. But really, it's an extremely lopsided debate, right? If you allow those louder, you know, sort of proponents of wanting to continue doing this to frame the debate and now as sort of, you know, reasonable people were trying to take their points and, you know, kind of mull them over... And now we're thinking about, well, is it sort of a reflection about an unfair hierarchy that people's taste preferences should, you know, override something that's, you know, suffering? Or is it about, you know, culture and what does culture mean into all this? No, remember the function is to get you to distract yourself from the core issue and to look like it is a, let's say, a symmetrical one side or the other side. And it really is not. These are effective diversion tactics. Because at the end of the day, if you really plainly say what they're doing, they're saying on one side, you have the vast majority of human beings who say this is cruel and we don't want it to be around and it's really, really bad. And on the other side, you have a small number of people who A, are benefiting financially from this, right? And B, their main complaint is they don't want to be told what to do. Well, sorry, but that's not how morality works. That's not how law works, right? We have a society with principles and governance and fairness and justice and all these processes that go into discerning what can or cannot be put into the stream of commerce, what can or cannot be produced in the first place. And there is no reason why somebody's sort of general frustration with a rule existing should be put on the same moral plane as, you know, the majority of other people who have a strong argument, like you say, this is extreme suffering. It not only is a lopsided debate, it's a lopsided power dynamic, because all they have to do is let the status quo continue, right? And we're trying to actually change something. And then to answer your question about animal welfare, animal rights, I think this point about cruelty is really the most powerful point. If you have extreme amounts of suffering, and you are imposing that, you know, humans are imposing 
cruelty. So that would be pain, suffering, and deprivation. And they're all a little bit different. You are going to be sort of on the wrong side of public opinion for about 97% of the population. So it doesn't matter as far as I can tell, when I looked around for this, the research that I could find on this, it does not matter how you sort of slice up people, what country you're from, what your political orientation is. It matters a tiny bit on political orientation, especially if you flag environmentalism in it. It doesn't matter your gender, your age, any of those things, right? It does seem like more or less it is a human quality sort of inherently to oppose cruelty to animals. Now, the paradox is we have in every place where all those surveys surveys were done, we have extreme amounts of cruelty to animals being done at, you know, very, very widespread levels. And there's a lot of money that's being produced in that process. That's the backdrop to me. It's like the cruelty is the thing. And then it's a question of if you sort of roughly want to define animal welfare, it's the focus on how are, are the animals treated and how do you reduce suffering and less of an interest in trying to change or no interest at all in trying to change the system of the fact that they're being bred and raised in confinement, et cetera, and killed. And more, how do we improve the conditions within that system? It's not really challenging the system. Animal rights, I mean, at like sort of an academic level, it's very sort of specific, you know, has this whole rights history. But I would say more more sort of commonly what people think about that is what I would think of as abolitionism, meaning saying the system is so bad and the unfairness of the fact that we are creating animals' lives just to put them in these systems where they are going to suffer and they are going to be deprived and they are going to be in pain and then we kill them way before their natural lifespans would be up, you know, that itself is the problem. So we want to upend the system. So I, I would say those are sort of the two ways of looking at it. Honestly, I think in real life, most the, of the interventions that we can do are, you know, kind of aligned with both points of view. I, I do think most people, when they're new to the issue, are probably more welfare aligned. And then as they learn more and they learn just how bad it is and just how complex animals are, they start to push themselves, you know, more into the rights or abolition side. I mean, certainly for myself, after having, you know, almost 20 years of looking at investigations footage, is the system is absolutely broken. It's completely rotten. There's no way to do this in a way that even the most sort of moderate welfare person could could stomach after they're looking at the reality of what happens in these places. Do you think there's also something that happens on a moral level that once we've said yes to the factory farming of animals, it becomes hard morally to parse out specific practices. Once you've opened the door to factory farming, you're just like, it's fine. And the brain has trouble even separating out certain practices as being worse than others. I don't know if you've had this experience, but whenever I bring up what I do for a living to a you know a person like let's say I'm like you know at the park talking to another mom or I'm at a party or whatever, I'll get one of two responses. One is, oh my god, that's so cool, or don't tell me about it because it'll make me want to stop eating animals, right? And what are what is people doing when they're saying that? They're realizing that the system itself is such a problem. That if they had the facts, they could not sit in that dissonant place. Even if they don't have to fully articulate that whole process of, well, I've already justified something that I realize is hard to justify, and therefore it's going to be clouding my judgment on individual practices. They see that the logical conclusion would take them to a place that they're not ready to go yet. We also have to realize that every opportunity we have to get a platform, every time we get media on this issue, every time we're out there talking to people on the streets, we have to connect the dots for those people. We have to tell a bigger story. Don't waste those opportunities to educate people and engage them you know, on these issues because as much as it is about the thing, right, we want to get those ducks out of the system, it's also about building that groundswell and that sort of grassroots movement, which is absolutely a necessary part of every movement. Factory farming of land animals has been happening for decades, and activists have been fighting these cruel institutions for most of that time. But the latest campaign I encountered 
represents one to stop the factory farming of an animal that hasn't ever been farmed at all before, octopus. The octopus that we consume came from wild fisheries, so wild caught octopus. So the problem is that we have been over exploiting these populations, these wild stock populations. And, and then industry realized that if we were able to farm them, that could be a big business. For the past decade or so, octopuses have been having a moment. They've garnered new respect and admiration. Remember Inky, who in 2016 captured the world's imagination by escaping from a New Zealand aquarium and slithering into a drain on the floor and making it out to sea? Or the cephalopod at the center of 2020's documentary, The Octopus Teacher? People have come to understand that octopuses are intelligent, creative, and sentient, capable of sensing and feeling. If Inky couldn't stand the aquarium, it stands to reason that farming these creatures in crowded tanks would be a bad idea. I'm Dr. Elena Lara, and I work in Compassion in World Farming as a Senior Research and Public Affairs Advisor. So my organization, it's an organization that is advocating for uh, the welfare of farm animals and also uh, to improve the systems and the conditions where we produce right now farm animals. Because not just for the welfare, you know, like, uh, but of the animals that are involved in these production systems, but also for the environmental impacts that it has, and also for the, the impacts that has also like uh, in the people, you know, in the health of people. We are not a vegan or vegetarian organization. We mainly are against factory farming. And about the animals that we work with, it's farm animals, land animals. And we have also like a team of aquatic animals that since now it has been quite like a, no one has properly pay attention to the aquatic animals that we farm. You know, because the consumption of octopus, we know that in Mediterranean countries, it's a tradition. And like Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy, we consume octopus as a traditional dish. But there's also like uh, new countries interested on this product, like Korea, Japan, US. As we are overexploiting the the, the wild populations, we industry uh, trying to like thought that it could be quite good if we were able to farm them, to farm octopus. So we're in the point like scientists has been like right now for like in Spain have been like around 20 years investigating how to raise octopus in captivity. But the project started with scientific interest. It was not behind uh, this project. There was not like a business interest or commercial interest. It was just like scientists wanting to close the biological cycle of octopus. It was very difficult. The octopus change. I, I don't want to say the morphology, but yeah, I mean, somehow there's different phases in the biological cycle of octopus. The adult octopus lives in rocks, but the larvae, it's like, it's just a swimming animal, you know? So there's different process in the biological cycle. So it was not easy to close the biological cycle. Once they did it, a company or several companies were interested to buy this knowledge you apply it for a commercial reasons, so to farm them. One company in Spain buy this information, we call it like a patent, you know, like the scientific uh, group established like a patent, and this uh, company bought this patent in order to use this knowledge and farm this octopus. So at the beginning, for as far as we know, was difficult, you know, because all the biological characteristics of these animals to, to keep them in intensive conditions or in, keep them in tanks, it looks like they have achieved this. And they plan to build the first octopus farm in Spain, in the Gran Canary Islands. It's in the moment that, that we are right now. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by closing the biological cycle for an octopus? Yeah, of course. When, when you have like an animal in captivity, you can like take them from the wild and raise them in tanks or in a cage. Or what you can do, it's just like recreate the biological cycle. So you are able to have your animals in captivity that goes from the egg until the animal dies. So you can take the juveniles or the larvae from the wild and then rear them in a farm or, I don't know, in a zoo or in a cage. For example, in octopus, the female needs to feel comfortable to spawn. The larvae needs a specific diet that it was really difficult for the scientists to know exactly what the, the you know, the paralarvae and larvae needed in order to become juveniles and also like to not to have high mortality rates and not lose most of the juveniles or larvae in the process. For anyone who knows a little bit about 
fish aquaculture, they know that there's kind of a few different ways you can do this, right? You can do it in open water close to the shore. You can do it way out in open water. And this is all with nets. Or you can build a tank on land and do it there. We are talking about uh, land-based systems. So they are going to be in tanks. Yeah, in closed in tanks in an on-land farm. I mean, from our perspective, there's first the, the reason that these animals are not suitable for intensive farming conditions because we know that octopus are solitary animals in nature. They do not uh, live in groups. They live alone. They usually, you know, in nature, they are hide and they just go out for like hunting or like if it's mating period. So when you think about an intensive farm, they are going to be in a tank with a lot of octopus. And this is going to be really stressful for an animal that he, their natural behavior is solitary and territorial animal. This is going to become like a, you know, like a very stressful situation and also can, can become like aggression between them. Or we have seen also that this can also lead to cannibalism between, between the individuals. One reason is this one. The other reason is that we know that these animals are like very intelligent. So keep them in tanks that are completely empty with no uh, interactions and with nature and nothing that they can, you know, like develop their intelligence. We think it's cruel. We are an organization that we are against factory farming. And we think that we should like stop factory farming and find more natural, friendly, regenerative ways to farm animals. So Create a new factory farm. It's not right now. We think that it's a right forward for aquaculture industry to do that. And as with the farming of any animal, how we kill the animals, how humanely or not, is a big question. One thing that we are really concerned also, it's, uh, you know, the killing methods uh, that they are planning to use for the farm. They want to use this technique that it's called ice lorry. So mainly the method is to put these animals, you know, in huge tanks with cold water and ice. And it's a method currently used for fish and has been using in the past for aquatic animals. But now, thanks to the science and the research that has been done um, in the topic, we know that animals suffer with this method. It's a really slow and long and painful death. And when we saw that the Anua Piscanova is planning to kill, you know, octopus this really concerns us. And it's another point, like we're saying, this farm cannot, you know, go ahead if at least a humane method of a slaughter is used because you cannot put this project in place, say that you're going to plan to slaughter 1 million animals per year and you don't have even a humane method in place. You mentioned earlier, like we're already far down the road with so many other kinds of factory farm. This hasn't started yet. Let's not start it. Can you talk more about that opportunity here of stopping something before it starts? If we have the opportunity or we were successful, you know, and stopping this, it means like we are in the right way. Like, I mean, we, we don't want more factory farms. We don't want new species in, in these factory farm systems, you know, in these intensive uh, production systems. Since I work uh, around octopus, it's like a lot of people uh, ask me, like, which one is the difference between a pig or an octopus, you know? What makes them special? You know, why people, it's completely against octopus farming, but what happened with pigs or other animals? And for me, it's just like the answer is they are the same, because we know also that pigs are really intelligent. For me, the difference is like, let's not do the same to a new animal, a new species. Let's stop it before it happens. Right now, we have the amazing opportunity to avoid that what we have done, you know, in these intensive farms of pigs. We can avoid that to octopus. So I think that's the great thing that we can achieve here. For a long time, as we discussed with Cheryl Leahy of Animal Outlook, there have been some animals that are protected by basic animal cruelty or animal welfare laws, and some that are not. And marine animals, including octopus, generally have not been considered worthy of those very minimal protections. Europe can consider that cephalopods are sentient beings. There's a piece of legislation in Europe that protects animals that, that are used for scientific purposes that protects the welfare of cephalopods. Last year or two years ago, the UK also recognized, like, not just cephalopods, but also, like, decapods and, you know, like, crustaceans, decapods, cephalopods, other animals, as they are invertebrates, we were not, like, uh, consider them as sentient. UK, for example, last year, 
recognize this group of animals as sentient. And it has been because a group of uh, scientists in UK from the London School of Economics, um, they produce a report, you know, gathering all the scientific information and proving to the government, like, hey, these animals are sentient. They need to be recognized by legislation. They are sentient. And from there, we need to create, like, welfare protection for them. And Europe, for example, also could recognize these animals as sentient, you know, and protect them for scientific purposes. The problem is, like, as they have never been farmed before, there's no legislation covering their welfare needs. In US legislation, it's more complicated because I think that, um, and I'm not fully aware how it works in US, but I think that aquatic animals, if, as far as I remember, they are not covered. But well, now US is doing great steps on the octopus farms, and I think they are like putting the way forward for other countries. Washington state was the first one to create a bill to ban octopus farming in this state. The bill was signed. So right now is the first piece of legislation in the entire world that prohibits octopus farm. And Hawaii and California is following uh, Washington state. So there's bills there to prohibit octopus farming. But the most exciting thing is that California has gone further. They want to, to ban octopus farming in California, but they also want to ban imports which this will be huge because it means, for example, we know that the Spanish company that uh, you know is planning to build this farm in Spain, one of the objectives also like export octopus products to US because in US, octopus products are becoming like quite famous and big part of the production was to export to US. So if we have, we see that these builds are happening in US, banning imports, this is going to be huge because it's a very big step that makes harder for the companies to make it success an octopus farm. What are the nuts and bolts of your campaign against this proposed farm in the Canary Islands? So uh, our objective, it's not just to stop this farm, it's to stop octopus farming, you know, the concept of farming these animals. So we think that the win comes from the public awareness, of course. And the other thing that we need, it's a policy win, I think. We are like working from local, national, European, global level. It's not something that we think, okay, if we close the Canary Islands farm, you know, we have win because maybe this not happened, but it might happen in other places. So we're looking for it just like a more systemic change, I would say. I wanted to ask back to kind of the sentience and intelligence question. Do you find as campaigners for animal welfare, is it helpful to have as your poster child an octopus, uh, a creature that captivates people's imagination and that is intelligent and sentient and all of those things. Can you talk about the kind of opportunity there? I've been working on aquatic animals uh, for the past six, six years, and it has been so hard for our team to get people engaged with the topic. It's so difficult that people uh, show empathy and care and interest on fish and other aquatic animals. And then when we started working on octopus, we saw that, you know, a lot of people wanted to collaborate, engage with us. The work that we do on octopus opened the door for other aquatic animals. With other sentient, highly intelligent and social animals like pigs, the factory farming ship has sailed. It's an entrenched, highly integrated, and powerful system. And while we can try to change the cruelest of confinement practices, like gestation crates, which are now prohibited in California law, along with veal stalls, it's hard to imagine stopping the whole enterprise. Octopus represents an opportunity to stop something entirely before it begins. There's something else to note about veal production. There's technology being developed to identify male calves before they're born, to eliminate the need to figure out what to do with them all. It's similar to in industrial egg production, where new technology has been developed to sex an egg and destroy the male eggs before they become developing embryos. So you don't have the problem of needing to kill all of these male chicks. So I was curious to know from Daisy Freund if this represents a real potential solution to the problem of veal. On the dairy side, there is a practice that is growing and a lot of, you know, interest in the dairy space and a lot of literature on it of using sexed semen 
So they know that this is a socially unacceptable situation where, and in addition to being an economic problem for farmers, and there is a push to impregnate dairy cows with female sexed semen so that they produce more females. Like I said, the dairy industry only needs 32% of the calves that they produce to replace their herd. So having 100% females would just create more of a glut of females. It's not a perfect solution. There is not a 100% replacement rate. It's not a silver bullet. But what's also happening is using semen from the beef industry on dairy cows. So they're actually crossbreeding to create a, a cow, that, a calf that's going to grow up a bit you know, more quickly and more like a beef animal. So you can see there's this kind of incredible amount of technology and uh, intervention that could be happening on the average mega dairy where there's you know many tens of thousands of cows being raised and milked where a exact proportion of them are get, receiving sex semen to create the number of females that they need and then there's the rest of them are receiving semen from the beef industry and that's hopefully creating animals that would go into the beef sector that would be maybe the what they'd consider the ideal. The reality is that that's expensive. It's not an expense most dairy farmers are able to take on. And from what I've read, there's also a lower conception rate with sex semen. So if even a small percentage of dairy cows on these farms where the margins are minuscule do not get pregnant when they are impregnated, that can eliminate any of the financial gain that could be derived from using sex semen. So right now it's not, I'd say, not at the point where it's a solution. And it's one of those things that, especially in the dairy space, where it feels like a very crude fix for a bigger problem. You know, it's like with pigs and piglets in the most intensive pork industry, they have a problem of the pigs being so frustrated that they chew each other's tails. So they decided to cut their tails off. Is that the solution or would it perhaps be better to give them uh, more space and enrichment and you know the kinds of environments that they need? It feels a bit like that where we are trying to lean on technology to get out of a big mess that has been created here. Question about the UK and the EU. Why is the EU so far ahead of us on a bunch of these things? Is animal welfare just, does it play a different role in the culture there? It's a great question. I would love to ask my colleagues at organizations that are international. We're just dealing with the, the US consumer base, but from everything I've heard from talking to them and watching how the campaigns play out, you are dealing with a population in general that's just closer to the farm, closer to their agricultural roots, and also industries that are less entrenched and powerful and able to spin out these deceptive marketing campaigns to counter our most natural instincts about what should be going on. So it's a combination of those things. There's so much investment by our U.S. food industry in marketing that obscures the truth about how animals are raised and so little regulation, so little history of regulation and then really no political will to regulate these big entities. And so it just continues and consumers are understandably in the dark about what's happening on farms and how their choices impact animals. That's really why the ASPCA launched the Shop With Your Heart program, because we want to harness the incredible power of consumers and, and help them and factory farming. And it's very much possible, but for sure, an uphill education climb when there's so much money behind this altered reality that uh, Big Ag would present. I think the veal story is such an amazing one because it really shows the power of the consumer when really the consumers just all drop their forks at the same time, right? It's just like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to eat that. And you can see this really dramatic, almost instant shift. At the same time, we all know that that's a very extreme and dramatic example and that some other kind of vote with your fork efforts have been less successful. Um, I know at Foodprint, we're always trying to find that sweet spot of – empowering individuals because we have really seen consumer choice and demand shift markets over the past, let's say, 20 plus years. 
at the same time, we know systemic change has to happen. And that's why you have a farm bill platform with all of those very exciting and meaningful proposals in them and, you know, California state level bills proposed and things like that. Yes. This is the ultimate question is really where does responsibility lie and who should be driving the change? And you know, not wanting to claim that this is really solely a consumer's work to to change a system that has been overwhelmingly shaped by by federal policy. And that's the reality. And I loathe to put the onus on people who are struggling to feed their families and facing higher food prices than ever to shift a system when taxpayers are propping up the industrial ag system right now, and it can really feel like a drop in the bucket. However, it is extremely important that consumers are educated and have access to information so that those of us who have the ability to maybe spend a little bit more time finding something better or spend a little bit more money to pay for something better can do so. Because if we only took the people who are extremely well-meaning and spending more money on products right now that are labeled as natural and family farmed and hand fed and whatever the absolute BS terms are that industry is churning out. If we took all those people who are feeling uh, unfortunately good about their purchase and even their, their increased cost on products that have almost no value that are just rebranded factory farm food. And we converted them to buying products that are genuinely better for animals. That would represent an enormous impact on industry. So there's has to be a multi-front approach and a multi-interest approach. This cannot just be consumers and it can't just be people in animal welfare circles going at this problem. You need all of the interest groups, farmers, environmental groups, worker groups pulling together for for holistic reform. So the farm bill is in process. People can be contacting their elected officials and asking them to fight for a farm bill that incentivizes more humane agriculture to spend taxpayers' money on transitioning CAFOs to higher welfare farming or, or specialty crops rather than entrenching the way we raise animals now through more funding and more subsidies. There's also a threat right now in the farm bill that needs to be blocked, something called the EACH Act, the Ending Agricultural Trade Suppression Act, which was introduced by big ag interests. And it would override existing bans on confinement, including veal crates, although that industry is fully transitioned away from extensive confinement the others, like we talked about, have not. Um, gestation crates and egg laying hens are still confined in battery cages. Um, and all of the awesome work done by animal groups across the country to pass these state bans in 15 states could be undone if the EATS Act or any language like it is inserted in our farm bill. So we try to, to work on many tracks at once. It certainly stretches us thin, it stretches the all the groups then who are working to reform animal agriculture. Food is a system, and that means we have to attack it from all sides. We have to have a more informed consumer base. We have to have better federal policy, better laws, and better institutions upholding the food system. Laws can limit the cruelest practices like extreme confinement for pregnant pigs or veal calves, or the force feeding of ducks in a handful of cities and states. But the food and restaurant industry will always contest these laws because they pose an existential threat to the entire enterprise of farming animals at a large scale. And these laws merely poke at the edges of this system, teasing out its cruelest practices or singling out the most intelligent or beloved animals. Can they save animals from humans' worst impulses? Can they force us to consider animal rights as worthy of our consideration? What You're Eating is produced by Nathan Dalton and Foodprint.org, which is a project of the Grace Communications Foundation. Special thanks to Daisy Freund, Cheryl Leahy, and Elena Lara. You can find us at www.foodprint.org, where we have this podcast as well as articles, reports, a food label guide, and more.